Chinese Americans, Native Hawaiians, Vietnamese Americans, and Filipino Americans. Several of these exhibits have traveled to various sites across the country. The program has launched two new initiatives, one to focus on Indian American history and culture, and the second to create a, a pan-APA exhibition funded by the Kellogg Foundation. Prior to this role, Dr. Odo served as a professor of ethnic studies at the University of Hawaii and was a visiting professor in various other academic institutions. He received an MA at Harvard University in East Asia Regional Studies and a PhD from Princeton University in Japanese history. Dr. Odo's work on Asian American history has been widely recognized. Among some of his accomplishments include being the editor of the Columbia documentary, History of the Asian American Experience, which was published in 2002. And he is the author of No Sword to Bury, Japanese Americans in Hawaii during World War II, which was published in 2004. Currently, Dr. Odo is completing a book on Japanese immigrant folk songs from Hawaii's sugar plantations. He is also consulting on several projects, including one involving the National Japanese American Memorial Foundation. Please welcome Dr. Franklin Odo. Um, congratulate the awardees and their families. Um, this kind of work, I think, in uh, various states and as uh, director of the Asian Pacific American Program at the Smithsonian, one of my jobs was to keep track of what's happening in the different regions and localities across the country. And I can tell you that, um, number one, there is a lot of activity. It's very impressive and is sustained and increasing in intensity and, and importance. And that you are, all of you here this evening, are part of a growing national movement that will not stop. It is something that is, I think, uh, going to be increasingly important to the national uh, identity and character, and the contributions you all make uh, will be noteworthy. And I thank you uh, very much for doing that. I'm delighted to be back in the Twin Cities. Minnesota has been a favorite destination of mine for many years. Partly, I think, because of its very progressive stance on, on so many issues. I want to thank Eileen Herr for um, inviting me here. And um, also Dr. Gloria Kumagai and the Japanese American community for hosting that uh, dinner last, last evening. Uh, David Zander has been extraordinarily generous in squiring me around the Twin Cities, and I thank him for his, his insights and his uh, knowledge and, and his ex experiences uh, that he shared with me. And Tron Nan, thank you so much for uh, lunch uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, thanks also to Brian Kalwar, uh, your gifted Laotian American poet. And uh, I, I want to thank all the different community groups that I was privileged to visit uh, over the last couple of days. I won't try to mention them all because I'll inevitably miss something or someone. Um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, the Twin Cities have a plethora of vibrant community leaders and it is a, a model, I think, for the rest of the country. So I think the rest of us can learn a great deal from you. You've heard that I recently retired as director of the Smithsonian uh, Institution's a APA program. I was there for nearly 13 years and retired, as Ver Verona said, to um, complete a manuscript of Japanese immigrant folk songs. It's almost done, thank goodness. But I have been working on it off and on for I don't know, maybe 15, 17 years, mostly off, which is why, which is why it took so long. Um, so let me say at the outset that I hope those of you who are 
in immigrant or refugee communities uh, provide space for the collection and preservation of stories, documents, and artifacts to be able to describe and analyze your histories. When, when I started doing research on early Japanese immigrants in Hawaii, I realized quickly that although this was an ethnic group, unusually rich in documentation with considerable heritage holdings, many areas were poorly recorded. This was especially true for the women. Most of the journalists and writers who, who took down the experiences of the times um, were men. And so one exception that I had not heard of for a very long time um, was these um, folk songs. They're called Hole Hole Wishi. And wishy, as some of you may know, the term that, that we use for m music or tune. Um, and hole hole is a native Hawaiian word for dried cane or drying cane leaves. Those cane leaves, as their cane stalks are growing, were stripped from the stalks so that the nutrients would keep feeding the stalks and create more sugar, rather than going into the leaves which were uh, not used. Then stripping the cane leaves also allowed the workers to then bury the, the uh, leaves into the ground and they became fertilizer uh, for the, for the sugarcane. The work was tedious and difficult. In the early days, uh, people worked six days a week, 10 hours a day, covered from head to toe to protect them from scorpions, centipedes, yellow jackets, rats, everything else in the, in the cane fields. It was very tough work for very little, little uh, compensation. I should say um, that the work was considered tedious and dangerous at times, but less demanding than, say, cutting the cane or carrying the cane, 80 or 100 pounds of cane up a ramp in, and dumping them into a flume or into a railroad car for uh, uh, transportation to the mill. Um, so because it was considered less demanding, it was done often by women. But I should say also that cutting the cane and carrying the cane was also done by women. And in some of the competitions that were done, uh, I think workers do this, whatever they do. People, no matter how exploited they are or how little they're paid, people take pride in their work. And so often you have competition, like log rolling among um, loggers, uh, for example. They, they turn their work into something they can be proud of and demonstrate to, to, their, to their peers and to their families. So people in, in Hawaii created uh, cane carrying competitions. And I know that at least in some, on some occasions, the women beat the men. So it was really sort of extraordinary. Um, and, and the men did holy holy work as well. So the folk songs tell us, because they're anonymous, that although there's no composer, uh, they're, they tell you from the perspective of different kinds of work. And I, I would sing them for you, but I would empty the room. So I will not uh, try to uh, do that. My kids, when they were growing up, when they were little, my, my wife has a nice voice, so she would sing to them to get them to go to bed. And when I tried, they said, Dad, um, you know, we'll go to bed quietly if you don't sing. <laughs> Well, these songs, um, some of them are quite naughty. And I, I, I'm especially uh, attracted to them, not because I'm naughty, but, um, but because, because it's such a wonderful thing to think about the immigrant Issei women um, composing and singing these R-rated, sometimes X-rated uh, songs. And it's so contrary to the kind of image that we're now trying to place on them. That, that I think is a wonderful thing.